The experience of white Christmas, think about it. You've heard it a million times, maybe two million times. Bing Crosby, White Christmas. And we look forward to it each year. It tells us the calendar is going to change to a new year. However, that moment is revelatory of a new book's breakthrough for me, understanding of our minds and how they work in our environment. Book is the experience machine, how our minds predict and shape reality. I welcome Professor Andy Clark, Professor of Cognitive Philosophy at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom and several other distinguished universities. Andy's book is going to take us to White Christmas and explain very carefully how it is that we can hear White Christmas when it's not there or when it might be there or when it's unintelligible. Professor, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much. The experience is White Christmas. The suggestion is, do you hear it or not hear it? What have you learned from um, the experiment that is conducted with a variety of, of young people who do know the song? What have you learned of the predictive brain? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so the, the White Christmas experiments are uh, kind of very interesting sort of set of experiments dating back actually to 1964, which kind of explains why they chose Bing Crosby's White Christmas as the, um, as the sort of core song that they were going to use. But the main ones were conducted around 2001 because they were more controlled, they were better experiments. And these involved undergraduates who were ushered into, uh, into a, a room and they were told that they were going to be played a sound file. And that in that sound file, there might be a very faint onset of Bing Crosby singing White Christmas. And their job was to touch a button when they heard the faint onset of White Christmas, if they heard it, because it wouldn't be in every sound file. And the upshot was that, in fact, about a third of the participants pressed the button at least once, reported good confidence in having heard the onset of Bing singing White Christmas. And it was checked beforehand that they knew what that would sound like. Um, in fact, of course, it was all white noise. There was no White Christmas at all in any of these sound files. So the question raised is, what's going on? Why do people confidently report, some people confidently report, here in the onset of Bing, when in fact there is no Bing Crosby in there, it's white noise. Um, the, the, the theory that I'm looking at in the book is a very, very detailed psychological and neuroscientific and computational model of effects like that. Effects where it looks like an expectation, a prediction was installed in the participants by the experimenter in their you know, white coat, confident um, sounding person saying, you know, there will be a, a hidden onset of Bing Crosby somewhere in these sound files. That made them up the weight, up the strength on their expectation. And it turns out that strong expectations play such a role in perception that the right thing to think is that perception itself is kind of structured from the inside out. The brain is predicting the outside signal and the stronger that prediction, the more likely we are to hallucinate that outside signal. Most of the time, there's a delicate dance there that we will talk about where with a certain give and take, we get things right. But that's the general picture of the, the white Christmas experiments, just a, a demonstration of the power of prediction to impact what you seem to be experiencing in the world. There is a physiological fact established about the flow of the brain and in the flow of senses coming into the brain and the flow of the brain reacting to its environment or its stimulation. And as I understand it, in any particular event, there can be four times the amount of information coming from the brain as coming in from the outside. What does that tell us, Andy? Yes, that's right. I mean, these numbers vary a little bit from brain area to brain area, but in general, um, downward flow in information, it outnumbers inflowing information, meaning that what the brain is kind of pushing out towards the world actually seems to be greater in quantity than what is what it's taken in from the world. Um, this, of course, is very interesting if you have a, a certain model of perception that goes back all the way to Descartes, 
where perception was all about basically um, things hitting the sense organs and moving deeper and deeper into the brain, getting more and more refined. If these stories are right, and I now think there's not much doubt that they're right, um, then what's going on actually is the brain is predicting what's going on at the sense organs. And then all it has to do in order to um, tune in on the world, if you like, is take account of the errors that then emerge in the prediction. So it's a very much a different picture. You start with a prediction, and then the world just gives you feedback on the prediction, as opposed to taking stuff in from the world and then trying to make the predictions or, or, or render the experiences, as you might say. Let's put it into motion, because that's a big part of our experience yeah. to correct. An example, we've talked about this. In the morning, well before dawn, my, my dog sailor and I go out to a landscape that is all wooded. And now and again, there are white-tailed deer on the horizon. And when I go out in the morning, there's not enough light to be certain whether I'm seeing them or not seeing them. I don't trust entirely my perception until they move. What I'm doing is I'm remembering that landscape. I'm not perceiving the landscape. I'm looking for differences in it from my expectation and the fact of it. I also check on Sailor because his sense of smell is a hundred or a thousand times what ours is. And if he's responding in the same direction, I have affirmation. If he's not, I have what you'd have to say is cognitive dissonance. And I check myself. What, how do I check myself? I move toward it. Now, what am I describing, Professor? Yes, I think th there's a lot of things going on in Predictionville there, if you like. Some of it is you come to the scene with a set of expectations about what's likely to be out there. I think white, white deer seem to, be, um, seem to figure in those expectations. And these aren't <clears throat> even necessarily being consciously rehearsed. I don't think you're going out there thinking, oh, no. I'm looking for white deer. But they're sort of installed there. They're the background to your walk into that landscape. Um, what that means is that you, at that point, are a very sensitive in one way, white deer detector. You're kind of poised for white deer, but at the same time, perhaps because your visual acuity is not as good as, or, uh, as, good as um, someone that was standing a bit closer or something, um, you're likely to get a lot of false positives. In a way, that's what the white Christmas experiment is. It's a kind of false positive for white Christmas. It's like I've got a strong expectation of Bing Crosby coming in sometime. And I start to hear it a bit like, also we can see faces in the clouds. If you sort of start to expect to see a face, you look up there, you can probably kind of find a face form. So I think that's part of it. You're kind of framed already by those expectations. But as you say, you know, we're not hostage to those entirely because we can check our own predictions by acting in the world to see what happens. You can move around for a better kind of line of sight or you can actually treat Sailor, your dog, as a kind of sensitive detector and you can assign high weighting to what Sailor thinks and allow that to kind of overwhelm what you would otherwise um, say is out there. So it's actually quite an interesting case for me because it brings together various things, one of which is sort of um, augmenting ourselves by different devices, in this case, Sailor. And the other is the big role of prediction in structuring experience in ways that are then tested by action, keeping us kind of honest, where possible sort of um, making sure that we don't just hallucinate our worlds, that we really stay in touch with them. What your book is, teaches me, of course, that my mind includes Sailor, includes my iPhone that tells me how long it is to sunrise, includes the fact that I have a bout of Lyme disease, which is from the deer tick, which is from the white-tailed deer. All of that is part of my perception. Uh, what's new and what's old? Have I read you correctly, Professor? Yeah, you have. Uh, one of the upshots of this, um, this account is that what we perceive in the here and now is kind of deeply rooted in our own past experiences. And it also reaches into the future because we kind of have predictions about what will happen if we act in the world in certain ways. You kind of predict that you'll get a better um, set of information if you move your head in certain ways or move closer. So prediction sort of Although perception happens in the present, the contents of perception seem to be really structured by the past and the future. I'm speaking with Professor Andy Clark, the new book I highly recommend, The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. Andy's a professor of cognitive philosophy at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. 
First, autism, overweight experiences. This is all fresh to me, Andy, that autism is not withdrawing from the world. It's overweighting information at the same time. Are you projecting on that information the way I did? Does it work in the same fashion? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, so one of the applications of the predictive processing or sometimes called active inference theory um, for autism spectrum condition is that a good way to think about it and indeed a way that seems to um, stand up to some clinical tests is as turning up the dial on sensory information over prediction. So the core picture in the book is that experience always takes shape at the sort of meeting point between what your brain expects and what the signal from the world is giving you. Um, if you turn the dial up too far on expectation, you get hallucination. But suppose you turn the dial up um, much further on sensory information, what do you get then? Then it looks like you might get a lot of the, um, a lot of the characteristics of autism spectrum condition. That's to say, um, it's harder to bring that very high powered sensory signal under the categories that you have. So it will be sometimes hard to detect faint patterns in the world. And of course, uh, people's facial sort of um, facial gestures that kind of show how they're thinking about um, your mental state right now. These are very faint patterns. Um, so if you're taking the sensory information super seriously, which is a picture here, then you'll find it harder to detect patterns like that. You might also find very noisy, sensory noisy situations to be uncomfortable or unpleasant because the brain is kind of trying to take all the rich detail of the sensory information very, very seriously. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of hard work. Um, particularly, you know, we, we sort of, we make life easy for ourselves by damping a lot of the sensory information down using patterns that we expect. So there's a sort of, there's a sort of picture there where autism spectrum condition mostly involves um, up in the value of income in sensory information. And this is kind of different to the, the, those sort of older accounts that say, oh, it involves a, I don't know, it involves a problem with mentalizing about other people or any of these things. It's, it's not, on this picture, it's not like that. It's, it's a different weighting of sensory information against prediction and one that particularly in the world we've constructed, um, that's to say neurotypicals have constructed, uh, can, be, can sometimes be troublesome can also be very helpful in some situations, allowing you to pick out um, bits of sensory information that other people are missing. PTSD, uh, 30, up to 30% you report, struggle with it, 60 to 70% do not, but the PTSD is again, the prediction machine comes up against events that are more vivid than ever and can be triggered by others, by overweighting certain senses. Do I say that correctly? Yes, I think so. Um, so the, the, the experiments that, that I was looking at mostly in the, in the section on that in the book are ones where they had a bunch of war veterans um, who had different levels of kind of um, symptoms of PTSD. Some had very few symptoms, if any others had very severe PTSD. And they wanted to try to find out um, what was the difference between the people that got severe PTSD and the people that didn't, because they'd been exposed to the same situations, basically. That was, that was a setup. Um, and what they found then using a, a, a little experiment where people were, um, they were trained on an association between different faces and the um, absence or presence of a mild electric shock. They got used to certain associations and then suddenly the experimenters changed those associations so that a previously friendly face now, um, now led to a shock. What they found is that in the people that were suffering from PTSD, there was a very, very, very strong response to unexpected negative information. Whereas in the others, there was not such a strong response to the unexpected negative information. So it's as if some predictive brains are more likely to respond strongly to unexpected negatives than others. And they are the brains, they're the people who seem most susceptible to PTSD. 
there are, of course, you know, cause correlation, um, direction of causation issues here that the experimenters also tried to address. And depression, uh, does that have a similar uh, difficulty? Disordering, I think, is the way you use it. Disorder of perception and uh, prediction. Yeah, I mean, depression is such a complicated case and comes in so many forms. There's a lot going on. But a couple of the things that um, I think we can pull out of predictive process in accounts of depression are that bodily inward looking bodily prediction may be playing a much bigger role than we previously thought. So the idea there is that the, this is um, these ideas are due to uh, Professor Lisa Feldman Barrett. So the idea there is that we're doing something all the time like budgeting our own future energy use. We're predicting our own future energy use and uh, that makes a difference to how we behave in the world. Now suppose that those predictions were going wrong you were, as it were, anticipating more energy use or less energy use in ways that um, don't actually track what's going on in your body. In that case, you might suffer from sort of sudden bouts of tiredness punctuated by unexpected bouts of enthusiasm because it's as if tiredness and, and lack of exploration is sort of conserving energy. And then enthusiasm and exploration is using energy. So if you get the energy budgets wrong, um, you'll begin to get that sort of uh, that profile. The other element I want to throw in here that, that I think is at least equally important. We have about is, 30 seconds, Professor. Oh, okay, is, is, um, is sort of um, lowering the value of positive information. So turn down the dial on positive information, and then you can't even improve how you feel by improving what you expect. The book is The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. Professor Andy Clark of Cognitive Philosophy at the University of Sussex is the author. I think, therefore, I am. We learn that in grade school almost, but certainly in college. And what Andy's work and the work of his colleagues have done these last years, this is the frontier of thinking about integration, causal loop for our thoughts our bodies, our environment, our tools, all of this comes together. There is a poetic way that Annis Nin puts it, once upon a time, we do not see things as they are. We, we see things as we are. Professor, it's poetic, but at the same time, it was very convincing to me when I came across it, your part of the book. Our whole biome participates in our perception, which we can qualify as this wonderful word qualia. We can also qualify it as emotions. So, and emotions as markers. I hope I've learned yeah. correctly, Professor. So what is it that Anas Nin is telling us? How is it that our bodies participate in our perception of the world? Yeah, so I think the, um, the lesson that I would take from that is that um, the predictions that seem to structure the way we experience the world are not just predictions of what's out there, like the like the white deer that uh, that you mentioned earlier, but predictions of what's going on inside our own body, what the sort of current energy needs of our body are, what's the state of our heart rate, what's the sort of what's the state of galvanic skin response right now. Um, so we're we're busy predicting the external world, but that prediction is constantly overlaid by these or, or underlaid, I guess, by these predictions of the internal world. And I think that means that um, changing the internal predictions can change what we seem to see and perceive. So there are experiments that show that if you give someone false cardiac feedback, you make them think that their heart is beating faster than it really is, maybe by a little wrist mounted device or something, then under those circumstances, they will perceive a face that would otherwise look neutral as if it was slightly angry, as if they're sort of taken their bodily response and doing a little inference unconsciously that is something like, well, if my heart's beating a little bit faster, maybe this face is interesting in some way, you know, dangerous or possibly attractive, but um, that's getting chucked into the pot and making a difference to how we experience the world. So I think that's one of the things that Anais Nin may have meant there, but also that our whole past history comes along with us when we um, encounter the world and that what we what seems to be a simple perception is a reflection of the stuff we've done in the past as much as it's a reflection of what's out there in the world. 
Yes, the word sentience. We come to your part of your book that you call an interlude, and I thought, where are we going now? And I realized that sentience has been used for several hundred years now. I believe that it's 19th century, but Jeremy Bentham and might be older than that, uh, to assert the supremacy of Homo sapiens. One of the one of the things your book did with for me, Professor, is it removed my sense that I know more than Sailor does, or that I my brain has more worth than Sailor's. And was that your in, uh, uh, was that your intention to make it very clear to us that all animals have sentience? Yes, that was the intention. The, the the sort of the core thing, the thing that really we should care most about, seems to be shared very very widely. Certainly, with lots of other animals, um, questions can be raised about you know um, single celled organisms, and you can go all the way down to plants and raise questions. I don't want to uh, address today because um, that really is getting into the weeds. <laughs> um, but um, but yes. For the, for the other animals, um, you know, sailor is a great example. Uh, they have all of the core, all of the core um, capacities that I think make us objects of moral value. That's to say, you know, they bring predictions to bear on their experiences. They experience the world in the light of their own um, histories. They don't perhaps, you know, I imagine that sailor doesn't look as far into the future as you look, for example, and that may make a difference. Um, also, we human creatures possess this ridiculous thing called language that does seem to do remarkable things to what we can think about and uh, how we perceive ourselves. But I think that's kind of all icing on the cake. The core stuff, sentience, is really widely shared, and it's all about bringing inward-looking prediction together with outward-looking prediction and generating experience. And emotions. Uh, I believe I read that you can't see emotions in when you track brains with the some of the tools we have, but you use the metaphor of emotions as markers. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a, it's very interesting that you know the, the the search for emotional brain circuits versus other brain circuits seems to yield very little. You know, there are the you might find some areas that tend to be a bit more involved in certain emotions or certain cognitions, but Overall, the effect to me seems to be that that distinction is very dubious, the whole emotion cognition distinction. And that what emotions maybe are really are underneath all of that is they, they, they're reflections of the bodily elements of the prediction machine in action. So I think our emotions, as um, you know, as uh, William James and others have suggested, are very much tied up with bodily expectations and bodily information. And I think they're doing something else as well. They are cluing us in to how well we're doing at minimizing prediction error. So predictive brains are strongly inclined to try to drive down errors in prediction. And some bits of the world pro provide us with opportunities to drive down more than expected amounts of prediction error. And they seem to be the bits of the world we like. Um, other bits can be very boring where you're not getting rid of more error than expected or too challenging when you can't get rid of any error at all. So there's a little sweet spot somewhere where we're doing a better than expected at getting rid of error. And I think that's an affectively positive sweet, sweet spot. That's part of what emotion is. We're in a good bit of the landscape for learning, really. Blue Hill, Maine, 2011, Hurricane Irene. You conduct an experience spontaneously about the taste of honey. What do you learn, Professor? Yeah, so Blue Hill, Maine, um, uh, then was, uh, I was kind of stranded there with the philosopher Daniel Dennett. And Dennett is rather famous for his um, work on consciousness. Uh, he wrote a book in 1991 called Consciousness Explained, um, you know, and has been working on that story ever since. Part of the idea there is that the things that, Many philosophers find hugely puzzling about consciousness, why, why it feels the way it does to um, experience the taste of honey, or why red things look exactly the way they do rather than some other way. Dan's idea was that we're kind of getting the cart before the horse here, that in some sense what's going on is that when we 
experience the pleasant taste of honey, it's because we expect to have certain kinds of reactions when we encounter honey. We've learned that we tend to lick it, we tend to seek it out. Some individuals have learned the other stuff, but you know they've learned that they tend to spit it out, that they don't move towards it. But because we don't really know what's going on inside ourselves as all that's going on, we've got this minimal model of ourselves that then says, well, you know, I'm moving towards the honey because it tastes nice or because I'm the kind of person that likes honey. Um, but actually, if then it is right, the sort of the, the arrow of influence is going in the other direction. We're observing our own responses and we're constructing a kind of story around those responses that posits all these things that philosophers have found problematic or, or difficult. So it's a, it's a strong and challenging story. It sort of, it says consciousness is real, but it's not quite what we thought it was. Um, I do think it fits in well with the predictive brain kind of, uh, kind of account, although it's a, uh, in some ways it's a kind of optional extra. That's why in the book, I keep it to the level of the interlude. The predictive brain is always seeking more information. That's why we move. That's why we, uh, look for, or look around us for other validations of what we're seeing. And the predictive brain seems hungry for better and better data uh, to minimize the error. Uh, and that is true for human beings. Or the question here is, are there, are there people who do not find that level of curiosity comfortable? Uh, or is that the nature of of who we are as homo sapiens, we're always gonna want more information. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it seems to me that there are, there are big individual differences here. So, you know, some people are more exploratory in a given situation than other people. They are more likely to go and forage for new information rather than exploiting the stuff they already know. You know, maybe some people are more inclined to look for a restaurant they haven't been to before rather than to just revisit one that they know does good food. I do think that it's useful in a population to have this sort of spread of tendencies to exploit and tendencies to explore because, you know, when circumstances change, um, that could be very, very handy. There have been some members of the population who have been going out and finding new things. And in other times, there'll be others who are making the most of the things that are already there. So I think you do expect individual differences. The What's important to me here really is that the predictive brain loves in general to reduce its own uncertainty by taking action. That could be recalling something from your own memory. So you might reduce uncertainty about, you know, what restaurant you want to go to by recalling an experience of having a lovely meal somewhere. You might also try to reduce uncertainty by firing up the web and looking at reviews of restaurants that you've not been to yet. Um, in many ways, the predictive brain doesn't seem to care whether it reduces salient uncertainty by taking internal action or external action. And for me, that's why it's sort of this, this account fits rather neatly with other stuff that I've been very interested in that we've called the extended mind that uh, we are, as you say, augmented and extended by our best tools and technologies, the web, et cetera. The book is The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. So we come to the tools that we have, uh, similar to what an orangutan named Migo uses when crossing a river, or when someone who is new to New York uses when finding the Museum of Modern Art. Let's start with Migo. Migo is an orangutan with a skill set. And he has a mind, clearly. What is his skill set and what do we make of it, Professor? Yeah, so the Migo case is, uh, is, a, is a cool one, I think. It's uh, an orangutan, Migo. And other orangutans do this too, but Migo is the, is the kind of poster child. Um, when the orangutan approaches a river, it grabs a nice long stick and it uses the stick to probe the depth of the water before venturing into the river because if it's too deep or the current's too strong, not a good idea to try to cross right now. So what Migo's doing here in predictive processing terms, uh, the, the account pursued in the book, is taking action in the world to try to reduce their own uncertainty 
about what's going to happen next. So it's all tied into the idea they're busy predicting what's going to happen next, but there are uncertainties there and they need to get rid of them by, in this case, sticking the stick into the water. Um, we do things like that too. You know, if I want to go to the cinema tonight to see a particular movie, I'll probably fire up the internet to work out, um, you know, when the movie is um, showing and where it's showing. That's me taking a kind of action, very much like me go with, uh, with the stick. I think any animal whose brain has a time horizon, that's to say it can look a little bit into the future, can kind of be asking itself, what action can I take to reduce my uncertainties, to reduce my errors as I try to approach my goals? And this sort of brings simple actions like Migos and more complex ones like all the things we do with our iPhones or indeed things we sometimes do with other people or other animals into a single framework. We're um, predicting where the good information is and taking action to get it. How powerful is our prediction, precision, error searching mind? There's an example the professor gives. I believe it was wartime Italy. Uh, a nurse ran out of uh, the ability to give morphine to soldiers. She was out of it. So instead, she gave saline solution and didn't tell them. What were the, what was the results, Professor? And what does that tell us about the brain? Yeah, this is um, this is sort of the among the origins of our understanding of the so-called placebo response. Um, what the nurse discovered was that um, in patients that knew to expect relief from an administration of morphine, if you didn't have morphine to give them, you could give them an inert substance and they would experience relief, genuine pain relief. This of course, so-called dose extending placebo is a very, very useful thing, particularly in wartime, could be useful at other times too. So it was part of sort of understanding that if we install the right predictions, we can actually affect the way that we experience pain. Um, and this has been shown in, in multiple other experiments. Um, it's also interesting to me that it shows something else too, which is that even when you tell people that they're going to be given a placebo, you can still get um, elements of the placebo response. And that suggests that it's not our conscious predictions that this is all about. It's deeper stuff that's been ingrained into our sort of habitual expectations. Uh, the brain is so powerful. I begin to think that we could cure ourselves, but you have a, a hesitation on that that you make very clear. We're not talking about curing major diseases such as cancer. We're yes. talking about uh, tactics, strategies. Uh, do you care which one? Tactics to deal with the immediate threat to yeah. your well-being. Yes, I think that's right. So, you know, the uh, the effects that, that I'm looking at in the book are pretty strong for things like cancer-related fatigue. Um, they're strong for experiences of pain. They can be strong for the um, for the sort of disability associated with certain kinds of long-term chronic pain. By changing expectations, it seems you can actually change these experiences. But of course, what you can't do is you're not going to um, cure a cancer or kill a virus just by changing your expectations. So there are, there are pretty clear limits on, on the scope of these effects. At the same time, I think they are ripe for exploitation. We now have a kind of systematic science that explains these effects. And so I think that uh, there's no reason not to rely on them uh, a bit more than we do. Do we, there's inward directing information gathering, outward directing information gathering. Uh, do we gather information from our bodies when we're thinking? Is that part of our, sometimes I feel extremely relaxed. That would be in the morning. I get up very early to read. Is that what I'm doing, Professor? I'm asking my body at the maximum authority of the day when I'm freshly awake to help me think. Is that what is that is that the predictive yeah. brain? I think it could be. It certainly could be. That's an interesting case again. Um as I think I as I mentioned with those uh, cases where they changed people's um perception of their own heartbeat, giving them a false perception that it was going faster. Similarly, if you gave someone a false perception that it was going slower, they would throw that into the sort of machine that predicts how they're going to be able to respond and behave. And they might find themselves feeling a bit more tranquil, um, being able to deal with 
tricky situations a little bit better. So it could well be that the kind of the expectations of, of morning response actually play a role in addition to the role that is played by just having had a good sleep. Uh, the prediction machine, the prediction, the predictive machinery, always processing, always looking for error correction. I begin to think just here in the final 30 seconds, it's like getting hungry and you feed it with information. Is that is that a fair metaphor? You're, you're curious and you're feeding yourself. I think that's right. Predictive brains are information foraging brains. They just love to be fed with stuff that will minimize errors in prediction. So yeah, we are informables, if you like, constantly on the lookout for uh, improving our state of information. I congratulate Professor Andy Clark, Professor of Cognitive Philosophy at the University of Sussex. The new book is The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. I'm John Batchelor.